Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us in this broadcast as we continue with our series going through the first epistle of John we've entitled Authentic or Synthetic Will the Real Christian Please Stand Up? You know, I really believe that the best way to learn the Bible is by going through book by book exposition. In this way, we can learn everything in the context of the original intention of the writer to his original recipients. And praise God, we've passed the halfway mark already. And so today, we hope to complete our study of 1 John chapter 3. Well, by now, you know that one of the purposes of John in writing his first epistle is to distinguish the authentic Christian from the synthetic one. He wants to show who is truly a believer and who is not. His Christian readers have been infiltrated with false teachers, which he called deceivers. Evidently, the people were having a hard time figuring out who were truly saved and whose teaching they should follow. Therefore, throughout the letter, he gives them some tests by which they can unmask whether a person is a Christian or not. These tests fall into two categories which we have studied in chapter 1. There's the doctrinal test and then there's the moral test. The doctrinal test is with regards to their belief in Jesus Christ. Do you confess Jesus as the Christ and receive him as Lord? The moral test is with regards to their behavior in Jesus Christ. Do you obey the word of God? Do you love the people of God? And so we need to watch their belief and their behavior. John is emphasizing that the two must be consistent. Where there's not only the talk about being a Christian, but there should also be the walk of being a Christian. So John is saying, don't be deceived by someone who just talk like a Christian, but does not walk as a Christian. Is he able to walk the talk? That's the main issue for John. And so here, we find early in the first chapter the tests by which we can evaluate whether a person is a true Christian or not. Like, do you believe the Son of God? Do you obey the Word of God? And do you love the people of God? And then in the succeeding chapters, John continues to develop these tests. He goes back to the same topic all over again, but this time he develops it in a different way. And this is why John's letter has been compared to a spiral staircase because he keeps returning to the same topic. Each time he returns to it, he looks at it from a different point of view and takes us deeper and deeper into the same topic. So John repeats himself, but never in the same way. It cycles on the, the same concept over and over again. We'll see this more clearly when we reach chapter 5. There, he will still be talking about the same theme, but in a different way, in a different format, with different terms, and he's just expanding it. Okay, so we saw earlier in 1 John chapter 2 that a Christian is going to love God, love others, and not love the world. And so his love life exposes him or herself, you know, whether he or she is real or not. So the question we need to ask to determine whether a person is a true Christian or not is the question, how's your love life? And chapter 2 asks in detail, do you love God? Do you love others? Or at the opposite end of the scale, do you love the world instead? Which, according to John in chapter 2, that we cannot love the world and the Lord at the same time. You see, for the Apostle John, there's no such thing as a worldly Christian. You know, that's a misnomer, according to him. Like, there's no such thing as a heavenly devil. And now here in chapter 3, John, again, is speaking of Christians as children of God. He says that as children of God, two things are going to result. One is that there's going to be righteousness, and number two, there's going to be love. And that is the theme of chapter 3. Notice that righteousness is the theme of the first 10 verses of chapter 3. Verse 7 says, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And then in verse 9, it says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in, in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. And then verse 10, it says, This is how we know 
who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. So the first proof of the man's claim in his moral behavior is righteousness. Is he walking the path of righteousness? Now, there may be times that he stumbles, but the direction of his life is righteousness. Sin is not the, the pattern of his life. He is not living in habitual sin. A real Christian is growing in righteousness. Now, the second proof of the man's claim in his moral behavior is love. That is his love for others. Look again at verse 10. It says there at the end, Nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Obedience and love are evidences of true children of God. Now, that's the theme of chapter 3. And you'll notice that verse 10 is the transition point where you have both righteousness and love to included. And so now, as we move to chapter 3, verse 11, we move into the area of love. Love for the brothers and sisters in Christ is an indispensable mark of a Christian. Christians will love one another. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. Now that love right there is agape love that has been poured out already into our hearts. That means, brothers and sisters, we already have a reservoir of agape love in our hearts. That means as Christians, we now have the capacity to love the unlovable, forgive the unforgivable, and touch the untouchable. It is placed there by God, a very definite characteristic of Christianity, Christians will love. Christian, uh, Christians will habitually love one another. Now, there will be occasions when they do not. But the habit in their life, the pattern of their life, will be the love of other Christians. But notice again verse 11, it says there, For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Now, that might come across like a duty, but that is not the point John is making. What he is saying is that loving one another is the proof of something. He is not saying, please, love one another. No, he is saying here, Please remember that loving one another is a mark of the true Christian. The heretics were coming along and boasting that they were in union with God, but they have no love for the Christians. You know, they, they have separated themselves from others. There's no community spirit. There's no communion with other believers. So now, starting with verse 12, John is going to go deeper into this topic of love by, first of all, describing what it is not, and then showing us what it is. So, I have entitled this message, How's Your Love Life? We're looking at 1 John chapter 3, starting with verse 11 to 24. So, if you have your Bibles with you, open out to 1 John chapter 3, starting with verse 11. Let me read from this translation. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why, is he, why did he murder him? Because his actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because 
we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. And this is His command, to believe in the name of the Son, in of the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He commanded us. And lastly, verse 24, the one who keeps God's commands lives, with, lives in Him and He in them. And, and this is how we know that He lives in us. We know it by the Spirit He gave us. How's your love life? Let's commit this time of study, shall we? Most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we just commit to you, each one right now, listening and watching this broadcast. Lord, we pray that your Spirit will move unhindered in our midst. So Lord, we ask, cleanse our hearts now through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ so that each one of us will hear the message coming from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. How's your love life? You know, John is using that question as a monitor on the legitimacy of the claims of these people. So here John differentiates the true Christian from the false by describing their love life. Okay, so the first thing we see here is that it's like what it's like when love is absent. Point number one is absence of love. Verse 12 says here, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So the first thing we see here, when love is absent, friends, the result is murder. Here is the lowest level of human relationships. You cannot sink to a, to a worse relationship with a human being than to kill him, right? That's the worst case scenario. And Cain is a classic in all of history of, of a murderer. And John introduces Cain as a murderer. Now, most, if not all of us, know the story of Cain and Abel. Remember, both of them came to worship God. They came with an offering. You see, Cain was not rejected because he's an atheist or an agnostic. No, Cain was a religious man. But he wants to worship God in his own way. But God had already revealed to them, obviously, that there is only one way to sacrifice to him, and that's the blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no what? The forgiveness of sins. God has instituted from the very beginning the proper way of worship, and Abel obeyed that. But there's another kind of religion aside from the religion of divine grace, and that's the religion of human works. And look at what Cain brought here. You know, he brought the fruit of the ground. He offered God what he wanted to offer God, not what God wants. He invented his own religion. He is going to worship God in his own way, and God would have none of it. Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? If you did what was right, Cain, I would have accepted you. He didn't want to do it God's way. He wants it in his own rebellious way. He didn't want the religion of grace by faith. He wants a religion of his own design of works and efforts. And so it's like asking deal or no deal. And God said, no deal. Friends, there are two things here in this verse that we need to understand to broaden the spectrum regarding the person of Cain. And then we'll see what John is saying. Again, verse 12, it says there, Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one. Cain was that evil one. Now, friends, there are two Greek words for evil. One Greek word is kakos, the other is poneros. Kakos is the uh, general term for evil, while poneros is evil in active opposition to good. Now, we can distinguish these two words in this way. Kakos is a man who is just willing to be a kind of evil and perish in his own corruption, while poneros is a man who is not satisfied to sin alone, but seeks to drag everybody else along with him. And this is the type of evil Cain was. He is a poneros one. He's into that organized evil and wants to drag everybody else into it. And this is evident because he was a murderer. You know, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said, The devil is a murderer from the beginning. And the very first crime he perpetuated was 
murdered through Cain. You know, his fingerprint is all over the crime scene. But now notice also the verse says, it says, Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Have you wondered how Cain murdered Abel? You know, I, I googled some of the pictures, and in one of the pictures, it shows that Cain was holding a jawbone. In another, he's holding a rock. In another, is holding a, a branch or something, and then hitting Abel on the head with it. So did he die due to a he head injury? I don't think that's the picture of what happened. The Bible is telling us a different way. You see, the word uh, murder that is used here, it means to butcher by cutting the throat. And why would Cain murder his brother by cutting his throat? Well, some of us may not have realized this, but when Cain and Abel were born, no one had ever died yet. There was no one who died yet due to heart attack or cancer. No one committed suicide by drinking a poison or jumping from a cliff. I mean, what would have they known about death then? What would they have, they have known about how people die or what causes death? They would not have known much. But God has revealed to them a certain kind of worship where they have to bring an animal and offer that animal for sacrifice. And they have been instructed to kill that animal by, by cutting its throat and spilling its blood. So evidently, the only way that Cain knew that something died was in the way that God, God had revealed. And most likely, that's what he did to his brother. The only way he understood death to occur is to cut the throat so the blood might be shed. Now, isn't that interesting? That God instituted a pattern for sacrifice to bring men to God, and man perverted it to separate man from God. The human race learned to murder when it was taught to worship. And that's life without, without love. They murder. Now, I know some of you might say, well, not everybody is doing that, Pastor Roy. Sure, not everybody murders. But let us go a step further and see another evidence when love is absent. Let's read verses 13 to 15. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. And then verse 15, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Okay, when love is absent, the result is murder. But then friends, the root is hatred. The root is hatred. So while it is true that most people have not murdered anybody, but John is telling us here that the only difference between hate and murder is the act, but the attitude is the same. There are a lot of haters who don't murder for one reason. They don't want to go to jail. But friends, I can assure you that if they can get away with it, if there's no punishment and no guilt, a lot of people would do it. But what John is pointing out, friends, is that in God's eyes, hate is the moral equivalent of murder. As the Lord Jesus himself explained in the Sermon on the Mount, he said here in Matthew 5, 22, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And then verse 22 says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Verse uh, continuing with 22, Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, and Raka means imbecile, you know, dumbhead, you know, is answerable to the court and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell what Jesus is saying is that murder is only the external manifestation of an internal menace and that is hatred in God's sight hatred is the moral equivalent of murder and if left unbridled it leads to murder now, this does not mean, of course, that hatred in the heart does the same amount of damage or involves the same degree of guilt as actual murder. You know, your neighbor would rather you hate him than kill him. But now John reminds us here in verse 13, verse 13 not to be surprised if the world hates us. This is to be expected since Satan hates God, so the children of Satan will hate the children of God. Have you felt that way? 
that the world hates you? You know, you do what is right and still they hate you? John says, don't be surprised. What should be surprising is if the world doesn't hate you. So why would they not hate you? Well, maybe they don't know you very well, or maybe you're too nice about some things, or maybe you haven't really been godly in the face of the world and confront them. Now, I'm not saying that everybody in the world is hateful and horrible, but John is telling us here that this is the general pattern of godless people. Some of them are gentle people and good people in terms of human standard, but generally speaking, the world is characterized by murder and by hate. Now, some people are bothered by verse 15, which says, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Friends, the issue here is not whether a murderer can become a Christian. Of course, he can become a Christian. The Apostle Paul was a murderer, and he's probably the greatest Christian who ever lived. You see, that's not the issue. The issue is, is, is whether a man can continue being a murderer and claim to be a Christian. And verse 15 says, no way. So what John is saying is that love is the surest test of divine life. Where there is no love, you have spiritual death. As verse 14 says, anyone who does not love remains in death. Now, we can discuss all the boundaries of this concept, but we can look into each of our own hearts and examine it. If I ask you, do you love Christians? Do you love the fellowship of Christians? Is your highest desire to be with those who belong to Jesus Christ? If you do not, then better check your heart and answer the question, how is your love life? Now, the next objection you might say, but, you know, not, not everybody murders and not everybody hates. That's right. But John gives us a third evidence when love is absent. He says, when love is absent, the response is indifference. Let's read verses 16 to 18. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can, they how can the love of God be in that person? And then verse 18, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Yes, it's true that when love is absent, not many of them are murderous, not, not many of them are full of hate, but friends, when love is absent, there is indifference. And this world is characterized by indifference and unconcern. So it's not just what Christians don't do that marks them. You know, they don't murder, they don't hate habitually, but it is what they do because of love. You know, they practice sacrificial love. They care for people who are in need. So if a guy says, I'm a Christian, but he sees a man in need and doesn't help him, John says, no, he's not a Christian. That's indifference. And so for John, love is not defined as an attitude. It is not defined as an emotion. It is defined as an act, an act of sacrifice. Do you see that? Now, there's an overlap here. You know, these verses for indifference are also the verses for point number two, and that is the presence of love. And the first thing we see is that love involves sacrifice. Love involves sacrifice. So the test of Christian love is not simply failure to do evil to others like murder, hate, or indifference, but love also involves doing good to them. You know, we're not told to love in the emotional sense, but we are to love as an act of, sac of sacrifice because love involves sacrifice. Now look at verse 16. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So how do we know God loves us? Because he says so? No, because he lays down his life for us. You know the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world because of what? Because he gave his one and only son. You know, every Christian knows John 3, 16, 
But how many of us pay attention to John, 1 John 3, 16? You know, it is wonderful to experience the blessing of John 3, 16, but it is even more wonderful to share the experience by obeying 1 John 3, 16. That since Christ laid down His life for us, then we ought to lay down our lives for others as well. Friends, love involves sacrifice. Now, someone might say, Oh, I'm a Christian and I'm willing to die for you because I love you so much. Oh, oh what's that? You, you need some money? Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot help you with that, but I'm willing to die for you. Well, that's why he wrote verse 17. He added this because true love isn't found in just dying for someone, but it says here in verse 17, if someone or any, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So what does it say? Whoever has what? Material possessions. Who is he referring to? Friends, that's us. We've got material possessions. Now, that gets very practical, isn't it? You see, love not only involves sacrifice, it includes sharing. Love includes sharing. It's the willingness to share possessions comforts and everything that has value if we truly love people then we should be willing to share with those in need now this doesn't mean that we are to just you know give our money indiscriminately the idea is that within the community of believers we should meet its others needs now i suppose the best illustration for this is luke chapter 10 the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the good samaritan remember that story who do you think is responsible to help the man who was robbed and left half dead by the, by the roadside? Is it the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? Well, friends, all three of those guys were responsible to help that guy. You say, what? But I don't know that guy. I don't have any obligations to him. I'm not related to that fellow. He's not even part of my care group. You know why they, they have all the responsibility to him? Because number one, they recognized the need, and number two, they had what he needed. John is saying, if you don't love enough to share what we have it to those in need, if you have the habit of uncaring, then John questions your authenticity. He says, you don't have to be a murderer. You don't have to be a hater. All you need to be is to be indifferent. And John says, I'm sorry, but eternal life is not abiding in you. The children of God will make su supreme sacrifices for one another. We're to love the way Jesus loved. We're to, we, we should be willing to wash each other's feet, to give up one's life for one another, to give someone what we have because he needs it. We need to be willing to make a sacrifice to show that we love. Friends, that's part of what Christian life is all about. And lastly, love not only involves sacrifice, includes sharing, it imparts security. Let's read verses 19 to 24. It says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and He knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And, we re and receive from Him anything we ask because we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. And this is His command, to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He commanded us. And lastly, 24, the one who keeps God's commands lives in Him and He is in them. And this is how we know that He lives in us. We know it by the Spirit He gave us. You know, I can imagine for many of us after hearing all these things about the kind of love that we should have for others, many of us could be feeling guilty, isn't it? I mean, who among us here can consistently love, be involved in sacrificial sharing 100% of the time? I mean, that's the ideal, but what's the real? Well, if we're honest about it, we fail part of the time, isn't it? And you know, when that happens, our hearts will try to condemn us. Our conscience will try to accuse us. Have you had that experience? 
you know, in a moment of weakness or selfishness, we did not respond to a need and the opportunity is passed and, and then we feel guilty for not doing anything about it. And so we begin to feel insecure about our standing before God. We are weakened by our condemning heart and accusing conscience. Then what happens? What do you do? Do you say to your conscience, conscience, stop it. Get thee behind me, Satan. Well, what John is telling us here in these verses is that, hey, if your heart condemns you, remember God is bigger than your heart and he doesn't condemn you. But we say, but God doesn't know me like I know myself. Well, oh really? But what does verse 20 say? Verse 20 says, and he knows everything. He knows everything. God knows all the secrets that are in our heart, the weakness of our flesh, and yet God doesn't condemn us. And so friends, praise God that we have an assured position. We have an assured position. What John is saying is that we have to check our hearts and see if there's a pattern there where we have exhibited sacrificial loving and sharing with those in need. Sure, there were times when you failed, but still you can honestly say that the pattern of your life, the habit, the character of your life is that of loving others. Then John says we have confidence before God and an assured position. But not only that, verse 22 says, and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. John says that our assured position gives us also the confidence toward God and the boldness to ask and pray for what we need. And praise God, not only is there assured position, there is an answered prayer. And finally, verse 24 says, The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Another blessing when we live in love is the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Living in love, living a life of love is the result when you have the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. That's, so, that's why the proof of authenticity according to John is the presence of love. Yes, our hearts will, hit, or will be hit by insecurity and self-condemnation. But John says the answer to it is loving indeed. And in truth, brothers and sisters, love is the final objective test for our Christian profession. And the fruit of love is security. Friends, authentic Christians will habitually love one another. Yes, there will be occasions when they do not. But the habit in their life, the pattern of their life will be the love of other Christians. The children of the devil is characterized by an unloving heart. Murder, hatred, and indifference. A man who murders belongs to the devil like Cain. A man who hates belongs to the world, which is under the devil's control. And one who is indifferent is living for the flesh, which serves the devil's purposes. The children of God, on the other hand, characterized by love. You see, the presence of love involves sacrifice. You know, children of God will make supreme sacrifices for one another. Also, it includes a sharing. God's children don't love with words but with action. They love to share with those in need. And lastly, love, the presence of love imparts security. When we practice Christian love, it assures us of our position that gives us the confidence to come before God's throne of grace to answer our prayers. And then the Spirit's abiding presence testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The proof that you are a Christian is simple. Just answer the question, how's your love life? Let's commit this time in prayer, shall we? Most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before your holy throne of grace. Lord, you know our hearts. You know that there were times when we were selfish, when we did not help those in need. And yet, Lord, we know the direction of our lives is that we are growing in love. And Lord, we pray right now for each one of us who are watching this broadcast. Lord, we pray that this expression of love will be seen more often in our lives, in the way we talk, in the way we behave, in the way we respond to the needs of others. 
And so, Lord, we just pray for each one right now, especially those around us who are in need during this time of crisis. Help us, Lord, to be aware of this need so that we can respond to them and give glory to you, who is our Father in heaven. And so, Lord, may this time of crisis be an opportunity for us to show that indeed we are the children of God because we love, because we share. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you right now. Thank you for these lessons. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you again, everyone, for watching this broadcast. Hope to see you again next Sunday. God bless. Hello and happy Sunday. It's our joy and pleasure for joining us today on our broadcast. Thank you so much for watching today's celebration. And if you have committed your life to Christ today, we have a special gift for you. Please send us a note by visiting our website at championlife.ca and select contact. You can also send your prayer request or call us by phone. And remember, you can give your tithes and your offering to our website, text to give, Use the Champion Life Center app or e-transfer your giving. Just make sure to select the location that you are giving to. Thank you so much for your continued support and may the Lord bless you richly. Feel free to continue to share this broadcast with your friends, loved ones, and family. And make sure to hang out with us right now in our Connect Lounge right after service online. Lastly, don't forget to follow us on our social media pages. This is the best way to stay updated and engaged with our Champion Life community. And of course, we want to stay connected with you. We are so glad that you have joined us and we hope to see you online next Sunday. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Be safe and God bless you all.